And where we connect with that mind depends on how we experience and what we're good at, what we're not good at, what we decode, what we like, what we don't like, but it's the same mind. And so often I see things that pass for spirituality that are quite blatantly expressions of mind posing as spirituality. Consciousness is that which is no time, that which is what people experience when they leave this reality, that which is eternal, that which is infinite. The mind is a construct, if you like, which allows us to experience this virtual reality. What happens is we fall in this false identity for identifying with the mind as who we are instead of identifying with consciousness as who we are. And that fundamentally changes the way we perceive reality and crucially the way we decode it. Symbolically, I would, everything is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. But there are different expressions of consciousness. There's that which is in a state of infinity and awareness that it's infinite, awareness that it's eternal, awareness that it's all possibility. And then there is consciousness that has solidified, that has become denser. And that's what I call the mind. And it's the mind that entraps us and keeps us in servitude. Just a view. I think when we are fully conscious, we have some way to go. When we are fully conscious within this reality, we don't need food. We, we, we get our sustenance from energy. What is, what, is, what is food? It's energy. That's all it is. Food doesn't exist like that. Food is like everything else in its prime uh, source. It is a, a wave energy and it's a digital electrical energy. So when we become disconnected from consciousness in a powerful way, we go into energy debt. And therefore, this level of us needs to um, somehow bridge that gap with what we call food. That's why we started eating animals and eating this and eating that. When it's not necessary when we're conscious because we are connected to the energy source that gives us all the sustenance we need. Intellect. We worship the intellect. It's become a thing that we put up there. Oh, he's got a great mind. Also, <laughs> the intellect is the mind. And if we get caught in intellect, we see everything in a partness, everything in terms of division, not unity. Um, and, you know, when, when I speak to um, um, audiences like this, just give out what I, whatever I've got. But when I speak to intellectual audiences, like elite students at Oxford University in England, I have to work out, I'm serious, how I'm going to put it in baby steps so they can get it. <laughs> Serious. Why? Because they are entrapped by intellect, they are entrapped, deeply, deeply entrapped by mind, which is what examinations are trawling for. Who's deepest in mind? Oh great, you've got a pass, first degree. <laughs> and then they go and run the system in mind, not consciousness. So this um this sums up for me where we are, and we can get entrapped in the mind game if we don't stay conscious. And this whole conspiracy that I've been talking about, writing about all these years, its bottom line is to hold us in mind, because then they got us. Are we consciousness or mind? Are we all that is, or are we just little me? That's the difference between freedom and slavery. This man, I went to the place where he used to meditate, uh, Ramana Maharshi, in India, uh, just before Christmas. 
And he um, spent most of his life just meditating. I'm not saying everyone should do that. I mean, you know, there are other things in life that you can do. But if that's your path, then that's what you should do. Um, and he said after um, experiencing this going beyond mind, mind is consciousness which is put on limitations. You are originally unlimited and perfect. Later you take on limitations and become the mind. And when we do that, we create a world of mind, and that's the one we're experiencing. We, we, drop, we drop pepper bombs on the most crowded piece of land on, on the earth in Gaza, and we claim to be conscious. Mind does that. Consciousness does not even consider the possibility. Because it's grown up. So it's not even so much, I would say, free your mind as even free yourself from mind. There is, I would suggest, a point where we have to be in mind to an extent, because that's the conduit connection that allows us to experience this reality through the left brain and stuff, which I'll get to. The question is, how much are we in mind and how much are we in consciousness? That fundamentally changes the lives that we lead and the world that we see. And people think that the heart is just an, an organ that pumps blood. Actually, it creates a massive electromagnetic field and connects us out there to what we call consciousness. The conspiracy is to keep us in mind, keep us in the head and out of the heart through manipulation of fear, stress, competition and all the other things. When I was in a, the only time I've taken psychoactive drugs was in 2003 in a rainforest in Brazil. And I took this ayahuasca stuff, and I had, I mean, not everyone has a good experience. I had a fantastic experience. Five hours, this voice, the female form, as loud as mine is now, talked to me about the nature of reality. And I came back and I, I looked through all the scientific stuff and tried to kind of see that it could be cross referenced. They absolutely can. And the opening line that this voice said to me was there's really only one thing you need to know. Infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. In other words, the existence of one infinite consciousness is the only truth. Everything else is the manifestation of that consciousness. The illusion. And this line I wrote in one of my books, love is not what you're in, it is something you are. One of the other great ways that we are scammed is to hijack the word love or the notion of love. It's just the word, it's the energy that matters. And so love is being attracted to someone. Well, I know people who work in the mind control or have worked in the mind control area who told me that if, as long as you can stimulate the, the right chemical in two people, you will get them to attract to each other and they will, quote, fall in love. What we call being in love is so often an electrochemical attraction. And we have lost the true meaning of love, which is not to fall in love with an individual, and then that's fine, I'm not knocking it, it's nice. But, to see that it is an attraction on one level. But what we need to do is understand what we are. Love. The kind of love that has the, a love for all things, for all existence, because we are all existence. Therefore, if we don't love everything, we don't love ourselves because everything is us and we are everything. And when we close the heart, to real love, get caught in fake love, as you might call it, electrochemical love. And when we fall for the scams of fear, fear of the future, fear of the unknown, fear of anything I can get you to be frightened of, then we go into this, what I call eggshell, where we 
become entrapped in a low-level auric field which works through the body and animates the body and works through things like we call thought but is caught in mind and therefore sees everything through the filter of mind and not through consciousness. There is another level of love which we connect to through the heart, vortex, which is to love all, not just one person, not just our families, but all things. And connect, therefore, to all things, have loving all things and connecting to all things the same. When we do that, we are in this world physically, but we're not of this world in terms of our point of observation. We're no longer caught in mind. We are seeing mind for what it is, a useful tool to experience this reality, but not the governor of our perception. And certainly, certainly not who we are. I had this, uh, was in the bath last year? I have one once a year. <laughs> and um, and I, I just had this picture in my mind. And what, what, what it was, I saw billowing energy, which I took to be consciousness, for some reason that's what came to me. And then I saw this eye appear in the energy. And then this um, telescope appeared in front of the eye, and on the end of it was the Earth, this universe. And then the telescope morphed into a human body. And I got um, Neil, Neil Hay, to, to paint what, what I saw. And what I, I was seeing, I was just anyway, is how consciousness... See, this reality is not malevolent in itself. It's just a virtual reality. It's just a way of experiencing. But it's, it's got hijacked. That's certainly this part of it. And we've got lost and caught in the experience thinking it's who we are. And so consciousness um, experiences through the body, and it like telescopes our sense of perception. Instead of the, the infinite that we perceive when we are in that level of consciousness, we're now more myopic. We don't have to be as myopic as we are, but we're myopic. We see things in a different way. Why? Because it's an experience. Good. But if we identify with the body as being us, then the experience becomes us, and life lives us instead of we living life. So we are consciousness having an experience, and we can stay conscious and awareness of who we are if we don't get trapped in mind. The auric field is this electromagnetic field, parts of it can be photographed, and it, it's, it's, it interacts with the body. In fact, it's the energetic, on low levels of it, it's the energetic counterpart of the body. With the body, it's energy anyway, all of that. that. And it's funny, when you, when you put an electric charge through a wire, it throws out a magnetic field. It's like the aura, because we are electrical beings, electrical beings on one level, electromagnetic beings. And so that's what the, the auric field is, and for me anyway, it's at that auric field level that we attach ourselves or detach ourselves from the wider consciousness. And it, interestingly, the earth is the same for reasons I've come to. It's a electromagnetic field. We're all different versions of the same whole. So that's where we connect to consciousness or don't. And we connect through the endocrine system, the pineal gland, etc. Um, as well. And we can do that to an extent and still be in mind, not consciousness. And if we close the auric field, then we become entrapped in mind and therefore see on its basis, on its level of perception. We open the heart, then we can open the aura, and we can connect to a much higher level of consciousness. 
But open auras don't do fear, and they don't do limitation, and they don't do little me, and they don't do I'm Charlie Jones or Ethel Smith. Otherwise, boom, that's what happens. And when the aura closes, then where are we looking to get a fix on who we are and the nature of the world we're living in? We're not getting a fix out there through insight, inspiration, intuitive knowing, because we shut off from it. So we look through the senses. And if out here, the same network of secret societies and families have hijacked the sources of information that are giving these senses a fix on who we are, then we're in trouble. And that's how we got into this situation because we look out here for answers and they give us the answers they want us to believe. Religions, political parties, and all this bloody nonsense. And when, um, when we uh, close off from higher levels of our awareness, then we get trapped in mind, going round and round and round in bewilderment trying to get a fix on something that we don't understand and try to work out through the intellect which is controlled by that we're trying to work out and doesn't want us to work it out. Well enough, it's Pope John Paul II I was surprised to find today who said the worst prison would be a closed heart. It's a pity he headed a religion which has done just that to millions of people, but I take the point. When we close the heart, we close the auric field because we close off to the full magnitude of who we are and we go there. And there are billions of people going through what passes for life in this state of utter bewilderment. The reason so many people don't ask the question, who am I, where am I? Because they instinctively know they're never going to find out and understand. In that state, they are not, but it's a choice. There are other states in which the answers lie. And we're now at this crossroads, this fork in the road, better way of putting it, as this conspiracy I'll talk about on Monday. You're not, you're not, going, to go, you're not going to go to bed early tonight, have you? Because I, I've got a lot to say, probably for two hours. Conspiracy has reached a point where we are at the fork in the road. We can stay in mind and stay in fear and stay in worry and stress and oh my God, or we can open the heart, connect with who we really are, and then the game really kicks off. Time is another one of the great illusions. You know when people go into deep, deep states of meditation, like when I went into the ayahuasca experience, and I've been in one or two experiences, such like without um, psychoactive drugs, you go into a space, and what do people say? When I go into that space, there's no time. No, no, of course, because you've gone beyond the virtual reality game. The, the virtual reality game, like any kind of computer game, programs into its construct anything it likes. These scientists go, why are laws of physics like this? Thank you. Why are laws of physics in other parallel universes different? Different virtual realities can say they have different laws of physics. You mean I don't have to pass it down to um, And time is something we decode as a perception, not as a reality uh, in terms of its existence. It's a construct. People talk, the scientists talk about time and space constructs. It's a construct. What did that near-death experience say? There is no time. There is no sequence of events. No such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. We are decoding, for reasons I'll get to, we are decoding a perception of time. And because uh, consciousness is no time, 
and we are following slavishly the, the manufactured time. I mean, crikey, you can fly across a uh, non-existent line in the middle of the bloody ocean and go into tomorrow. <laughs> I came out of Arizona three days ago and uh, went into um, an hour, was it early or what? What? What was the time? What do you mean? My watch must be wrong. No, you've come into California. Different time. It's a construct, please. And yet it dominates our life. Not enough time. Oh, God, what's the time? Oh, my goodness me, I'm running out of time. Stress, 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 time. Hey, have you tried to cross the bloody roads outside this hotel? Over there? You need life insurance. Honestly. And the reason I bring that up is because I've never seen this before. This is California. Um, I'm waiting for that red end to go green. That takes forever. I said bugger it a few times and walked across anyway. Green, green, sorry, I ain't waiting anymore. Anyway, one time it went to green and I started walking. Then I start getting counted down. And he start to run. Because of this attachment to time. That's a new one on me, that. The other new one on me was stopping for some gas, as you call it, petrol, and, and I heard the television. Yes. Yeah. I'm thinking, someone's got television in the car. <laughs> some bloody television. The pumps. <laughs> I mean, what's the point? <laughs> I don't understand it. I'm going to see two minutes of television program. I'm going to put the gas in. What's the <laughs> so, for now, is that place we go into, when we go into deep levels of meditation, no time. And through the heart, we get to that place. <coughs> through the head, we are decoding the perception of time. The perception, not in reality. As uh, William Blake, a uh, great British writer said, see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Everything is now. And I, I kind of symbolize to myself, anyway, uh, this, this section of time, like, like watching a, a, a movie on DVD. Um, when the movie starts and moves through, as the, what is it, the laser reads it and stuff? Wherever you are in the movie is your present. The scenes you've watched are your past, and the scenes that you've not yet seen are your future, in your perception. And yet it's all going on on the same disc and all exists at the same time. And it's the perception of time that, that gets us. And, and so, we go around what I call the time loop. I wrote a book some years ago called Tales from the Time Loop. I have a picture of, of the universe. I, I don't know why, but I always get it in this um, shape. That's what scientists call a torus or something. Um, and, and we're going round and round and round thinking we get somewhere. Time loop. My feeling is, as strange as it may seem, there are basically three types of people in this reality. There are those who are conscious and connected, very small number, but gathering all the time. Great time to be alive this, in this reality, we're always alive. There are a large, vast numbers of people who are conscious, but disconnected from it, and the mind is running the show. And then there are others that I think are artificial intelligence, in fact, far beyond what we see to be artificial intelligence. And the more that I the more that I look at this, the more I'm getting more and more convinced that these Illuminati bloodlines are actually artificial intelligence mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a level of uh, beyond what we perceive as artificial intelligence. This guy Sigmund Freud, a psychologist chap, very famous, once said the most complicated achievements of thought are possible without the assistance of consciousness. Now, he would have said that for different reasons for me, but from the perception that I'm talking about now, or the point where I'm coming from, I would agree with that. I think that it is uh, perfectly possible at the level of uh, advancement and understanding that is connected to this virtual reality and manipulating us beyond the human 
side of this to create uh, biological entities that have the ability to think and interact with the world and in a very, very high intellectual way because they are so much more computer-like uh, that because of the nature of the realities we code it, which I'll come to, absolutely look like any else. To say the intellect is what controls our reality through mind and it is possible, I am totally convinced, to construct biological entities on the level of mind that have the ability to uh, to function to a very high level of intellect, thought, while appearing to be human. And uh, it's not what was in the Matrix movie, of course, the woman in the red dress, who was a simulation. And because we're decoding, it's not actually real, we're decoding it, if you can trick the brain to decode it in a certain way, it looks like anything else uh, that appears to be human, but it's a construct. In progress. This is um, something I got off the uh, off the internet where they're talking about creating uh, uh, the, the uh, sequence of events going forward to create in our knowledge, in our understanding, um, artificial intelligence uh, like people. Conceivably, such uh, creatures they call them will eventually be built as artificial intelligence achieved through the use of powerful general purpose neuro networks encapsulated within a sophisticated life-like framework. Well, when you think that um, it's only a very short time ago in the understanding of science that quantum physics was understood, or even not understood, started to be un uh, 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 understood in terms of awareness, then where we are now compared with what is possible is the Stone Age to something I would say the modern world it's like the first stone age to me now. And uh, these are the, the levels that uh, life like robots have gone to and all the, all the rest of it. We are, because the body is a biological computer which consciousness works through, it is possible, I am totally convinced, to have a biological computer which is um, uh, connected to another source of animation and awareness uh, that we call intellect and thought. So, we are identifying ourselves effectively, when we see this with us, with a spaceman on the moon thinking he's a space in. <laughs> and if you think, you know, about that, if, if there was a, a spaceman on the moon and uh, he started thinking he was in space suit, well, Houston, we have a good problem. <laughs> uh, Houston, the Bill thinks he's in space suit. What? what? <laughs> we got a problem. Well, how about if we had a planet uh, populated by vast, vast, vast numbers of people who thought they, they, they were their space suit, who thought their vehicle was them, Houston, planet Earth, we have a problem. And this is why. We have the world that we do, and the bewilderment that we do, this false identity. This, by the way, the, the identifying with the body makes racism ludicrous. <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> so, we think we're humans, or many people think, most people think they're humans, and humans is a software program which we are decoding as an experience. It's not who we are, we're consciousness, we're not human, we're having an experience as a human. This is um, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle which talks about DNA. DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. <coughs> the difference between a mouse and a human in terms of DNA is fractional compared with the difference in the bodily form that is projected. DNA is made up of uh, four codes, A, C, G, and T. I like the G and T bit, so. Fancy <laughs> that, I think I'm G and T. And like everything else, it operates on different levels. On one level, DNA, the genetic structure, is a vibrational waveform field. On another level, it's electrical, electrochemical. And on another level, it is mathematics. It's digital. And interestingly, you know, when you start to see these codes of various kinds, mathematical codes, it reminds you very much of the codes in the Matrix. And incidentally, when in that Matrix movie, um, the people were looking at those codes, they weren't seeing green codes and numbers, 
they were seeing people, street scenes, cars, houses, landscapes. That's what we're doing when we decode reality into what we think is out there, physical world. When you, when you look at it, um, the way that they're now connecting the body to computers and having this computer brain interface, the reason they can do that is because in effect, although very different in advancement and sophistication, they are connecting to computer systems. That's how they can do it. If you, if you, if you go through the boxes of uh, computer uh, paraphernalia and what constitutes a computer and you go through the human body, it ticks the boxes one after another. When um, when a computer gets a virus or something, and it gets worse and worse and worse, eventually it won't turn on. And we say, what? My computer's dead. That's what happens when we, quote, die. We don't die. The computer ceases to function. Therefore, the vehicle is no longer functioning. Therefore, our consciousness leaves. We have, uh, we put computers into sleep mode where they just tick over and use very little energy. That's what we do when we sleep and our consciousness or aspects of it go experience somewhere else. When we um, are trying to protect the computer from attacks, viral attacks, we have antivirus technology which seeks out the virus, destroys it or takes it out of a place where it can do damage. That's what the human immune system does on a vastly more sophisticated level. And what happens, you see in your computer, where um, you, you get on email often, a new virus, don't open this email. Why? Because the computer software, antivirus technology has not been programmed or experienced this new virus, therefore it will not protect you. What happens when, for instance, the Europeans brought smallpox to North America, the Native Americans whose immune systems had never experienced it. It devastated them. Same thing. But the human immune system learns while a computer on the level we work with has to be downloaded. This is a picture on the, on the right, or on the that was on the right on both sides. I wish Barrett was here. <laughs> um, and it's a picture taken at the Necker Hospital in France. And they put a dye through the um, acupuncture meridian system and photograph it. And when you look at it, it's a motherboard. It's a circuit board. What does the circuit board do? It passes information around the computer. What do the meridian lines of qi energy, as it's called in the Chinese acupuncture, do? It passes information around the body computer. And what they found, and this is where acupuncture comes in, um, in one aspect, is that when this qi energy information is moving around the body too slowly, then the body ceases to function. What happens when the information is not passing around our computer on the desktop quick enough? Oh, my bloody computer slow today. What's the matter with it? Because this whole reality, whether it's the, uni uh, the uh, level of the virtual reality universe itself or the individual holographic parts of it, are all information being decoded into a, a particular reality. Then we have the brain, which is, in, interestingly, computer people, computer doctors, they call it, some of them, appropriately, um, they call the central processing unit of a desktop computer the brain of the computer. And the brain is the central processing unit of the body computer, which processes vast amounts of information and decodes it and passes it around. And the whole genetic structure is part of this decoding um, and uh, reception and uh, broadcast system, which I'll get to. 
DNA in the genetic structure is like the hard drive. Um, not just the physical level, because the physical level is just the coded energy. It's an energetic structure where information is held, which then manifests as the characteristics of the body and much more. <coughs> Creating this lower auric field, energy field, and the body. And so what we call cultures and all these different uh, societies, and ways of living, races, they are software programs running through the body computer. And if we identify with them as us, then we are operating on the body computer level of reality. This is a guy called William Sheridan. He um, was in a hospital, New York I think, uh, waiting for a, a, a heart transplant. And he took part in this art therapy course. And um, I'm a shy artist. I mean, I, 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 I draw like a five-year-old. Right? And uh, he went much better, at least, except for me, I would say. Um, and he, um, he was drawing stuff like this. And then he had the heart transplant, and as he was recovering, he continued with the um, art therapy course. But now he started to, the amazing this art therapy particularly, uh, um, started to uh, draw pictures and what have you that were much more sophisticated. Now, no one could understand where it was coming from. Eventually, um, he met the mother of the man whose heart he um, uh, was donated to him, and he asked her the obvious question, was your son interested in art? And she said he was so uh, fascinated and obsessed with art that by the year 18 months, he was asking for art materials instead of toys. And when you, there's a certain doctor, it's in one of my books, who has documented enormous numbers of cases of people who have transplanted organs and have taken on the characteristics, the abilities, and the characteristics, the personalities in many cases, of the donor. Why? Because that transplanted organ and its energetic counterpart hold information from that body computer from which it comes and when it is, it is uh, downloaded, when it is uh, transferred into another computer system, then that information becomes available to the computer system and can start to affect the reality, personality and abilities. It's my great friend in Africa, Crater Mutworth, the Zulu shaman in South Africa, and he, I was talking to him about this once and he said, well, in the days when they used to um, in people in Africa, he said um, they used to have this, this golden rule that you had to um, uh, um, uh, get them, cook them to a certain very, very hot temperature. Otherwise, the legend said, if you eat them, you will become them, which may have a similar um, theme. Now, of course, in this self identity that we have, there's probably nothing that holds us in a I am this and this is me, this is who I am, more than I am a man or I am a woman. Being a man or being a woman is an experience. It's not who we are. It's an experience. And it's a very valid experience, very nice experience, and all the rest of it can be. But it's not who we are. Um, how can it be? when chemical changes in the body can make move you from being a man to a woman or a woman to a man, in effect. This is a, a chicken, very much in the news about two years ago in Britain, Freaky the Chicken. <laughs> well, this is not him, this is a chicken to, remember, to, to remind you to tell the story at this point. Um, but freak, Freaky, I can reliably inform you, looked very much like this. <laughs> and what happened was, Freaky was born a hen, laid eggs, all the rest of it. Then, for some reason, it happens rarely, but it's not you know, unique, it had a, a, a massive production of testosterone, uh, started growing a comb, crowing at dawn and chasing the hen. Right? Now, how 
can we be a man or a woman when chemical changes can move us from one to the other? Because it's not who we are, it's an experience. I found this on the, the BBC website. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insects so that the group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. Well, that one there. No, no. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song behavior usually only seen in males. Because so much of what we call us, our behavior, our personalities, are actually the body computer playing through its programs. I, I get up early uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm writing in England, um, before, before uh, the sun comes up, often in the winter, and uh, as the sun comes up, bloody birds start singing. Now, is there someone there with a stick and a clock? Why do they start singing? Because it's the computer program playing through. Why did Freaky the Chicken suddenly start crowing at dawn? Is somebody telling that's what cockerels were supposed to do? He did it because he, his body had taken on that program we call male chickens. <laughs> so it was playing through. And of course, another thing that we think is us is our emotions. Well, how can that be when um, you can trigger emotions through electrochemical means? If you're in certain electromagnetic fields, you get depressed. There was a woman in England a few years ago who went into a clinical depression 14 years ago and went in and out of institutions and if she looked in the mirror, she would say, what, what am I? I'm a manic depressive. After 40 years, 40 years, yeah. someone said to her, can you think of anything that happened just before you went to this depression? She said, well, everything I can think of is I had 19 tooth fillings with mercury. Mm. Oh. So, a friend said, well, maybe you should check this out. What she did, she had mercury fillings taken out, she went on a mercury detox, 40 years of depression disappeared. And she thought that was her. No, no, it was the body computer that had been destabilized by chemicals. Good habits, bad habits. The computer playing through. I know. Let's be conscious. Let's have no habits. Let's just be in the bloody moment. Let's not know what's coming next because we're all possibility. Let's decode a different reality. This is the key to freedom. Is to, is to drop the fake identity that we think is us. Now the brain, obviously, the whole genetic structure is involved in this, but the brain is crucial. And there are two sides of the brain, right brain, the left brain, and what they call the corpus callosum, uh, callosum the bridge between the two. This is another picture I asked um, Neil Haig to do. This bridge is there to keep the brain in balance. The right brain is about out there, consciousness, the big picture, the big awareness of who we are. The left brain is that, and I'm not knocking it, it's absolutely there because it needs to be there. This is what connects us into this reality. This is what decodes language. This is what decodes um, uh, the, the reality and the, uh, the apartness so that we function in this world um, in the way that we do. If the right brain's open, then the right brain's got the big picture, the left brain can um, see that um, this uh, is... Uh, the left brain uh, connects us with this, the right brain can see what's going on. You get stuck in the left brain, you can't see what's going on. This was a uh, brain scientist called Jill Bolte Taylor. Spend a little time going through what she said here, because this starts to pull all that I've been talking about together. If you've not come across it, put Jill Bolte Taylor into the internet, and you will see um, her visual presentation of this story. Brilliant. What happened to her in 1996? She was a brain scientist, so it was great because she understood what was going on. She had a brain hemorrhage in the left side of the brain. And the left brain stopped working as it should. And what she experienced was incredibly informative in terms of all that I've been saying so far. She said that um, 
a blood vessel uh, broke in the left part of her brain, and in the course of four hours, she watched her brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process information, decode reality. On the morning of the hemorrhage, she could walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of her life.